Underneath everything we are, we are all people. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. We look for stories often where people are a victim of larger systems. When I report a story, the most important thing I can do is connect with the person that we're interviewing. You have to be genuine when you do it. You have to really care. I've been to Iraq like, what, six or seven times, Afghanistan multiple times, war zones around the world. If I'm going to justify going into some of the risky places that we go into, it's got to be for a real reason. The stories we, we really love to go after. The new season of Fault Lines, coming soon. About a year ago, Mark and I thought, air pollution, global warming, how can we make a difference? So first things first, Mark modified our car. He harnessed the wind. Then he experimented with microwave technology and some sort of homemade energy source. The best part is the car emits only helium. <laughs> Genius. Genius. But the EPA says the energy we use in our home can cause twice the greenhouse gases of a car. So I went to energystar.gov. I got tips on lighting, heating and cooling, and to look for the energy star on products we buy. As for Mark, he still marches to the beat of a different drum. I figure why not let gravity do all the work, right? <laughs> I know I'm making a difference. I just look for the energy star. The Environmental Protection Agency. job growth. The economy added 117,000 jobs last month, lowering the unemployment rate from 9.2 to 9.1 percent, even though layoffs surged in July and new GDP numbers showed the economic recovery is stalling out. The new jobs are just barely enough to keep up with population growth, and economists still fear a double-dip recession is right around the corner. After all, the most recent debt limit deal that Speaker John Boehner is boasting he got 98 percent of what he wanted in, is expected to cost the economy 1.8 million jobs by next year and suck over $200 billion from the economy just in time for the 2012 election. And Republicans are planning three more hostage takings, at least economy killing actions just this year. Looks like Republicans will get exactly what they want, a crashed economy to hang around the neck of President Obama before next year's elections. The Republican hostage takers get what they want again. Yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid announced the Senate will pass the House Republicans' version of the FAA funding bill that strips subsidies to rural airports, mostly in Democratic districts, and makes it much more difficult for federal air and rail workers to unionize. The bill is expected to pass the Senate today, putting the 74,000 FAA and construction workers who were the victims of the last Republican hostage scenario back to work. Senate leadership said nothing about the anti-union provisions in the funding bill that will only keep the FAA up and running until mid-September when lawmakers return from their vacation. So expect this break in the FAA hostage crisis to be only temporary. In the best of the rest of the news, it's good to be an American, a millionaire in America. A new report from the Center for American Progress showed that millionaires are paying, as a share of their income, 25% less in taxes than they were during the Clinton years in the mid-90s, 25% less. That's not all. According to data from the IRS, in 2009, 1,400 millionaires paid absolutely no taxes at all. So just like some of the biggest transnational corporations in the world, like GE and ExxonMobil, 1,400 millionaires were off the hook and didn't have to pitch in one penny to Uncle Sam. In fact, the average federal income tax rate for millionaires in America is around 22 percent, far less than your typical school teacher in Wisconsin is paying. And despite the fact that a majority of Americans support tax hikes on millionaires, our millionaires, as well as billionaires and transnational corporations, once again escaped without having to make one sacrifice in the name of deficit reduction like the rest of us. Last time I checked, the Constitution doesn't say we the millionaires. Thank you, Citizens United. Sarcastically, of course, Mitt Romney's presidential campaign war chest just got a million dollars heavier, and no one knows who's responsible. In one of the biggest contributions yet of this political season, the company W Span LLC cut a check to Mitt Romney for $1 million and then disappeared. The corporation was created in March, made the contribution in April, and then dissolved in July. No one really knows who was running the company during that time, and the owner of the Manhattan address that was listed for the company claims he has no records of the company ever setting up shop there. So essentially, Mitt Romney just got a million bucks out of thin air. That could have come from some billionaire hedge fund manager, some Chinese business tycoon, some Saudi prince, 
Who knows? The Justice Department says they're looking into the matter, but either way, thanks to our Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, the American people no longer have the right to know where their political candidates are getting their money. Expect this mysterious and sinister million-dollar contribution to be the first of many heading into next year's first presidential election after the unelected justices Roberts, Thomas, Scalia, Alito, and Kennedy rewrote our election laws. Surprise! After the dysfunction of Congress was put on full display in the debt limit debate, or a debacle, if you prefer, new numbers show Congress's disapproval rating is at an all-time high of 82%. That's the worst rating for Congress since the New York Times started keeping track back in 1997. But looking closer at the numbers, it's clear one party is more to blame than the other. Speaker of the House John Boehner's disapproval rating is up 16 points since July to 57 percent, 10 points higher than President Obama. And also, Republican disapproval ratings in Congress is at 72 percent, Democrats just 66 percent. This fits perfectly into the anti-American Republican political strategy, run on a platform of no government, get elected and run government into the ground, then run for a re-election on a platform of no government. Thirsty? Go to Mars. NASA reported a huge discovery on the red planet yesterday, flowing water. New pictures show what look to be dark streams on the Martian surface that appear to change seasonally, indicating that salt water may be present on our nearest planetary neighbor. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden said that the discovery about the discovery NASA's Mars exploration program brings us closer to determining determining whether the Red Planet could harbor life in some form. Well, as soon as we find out, can we send the Ron Paul and Ayn Rand libertarians up there so they can start their free market commune? It's never worked anywhere it's been tried on Earth. Maybe the lower gravity on Mars will change the laws of economics. And crazy alert, we meet the world's worst neighbor, David Muscat. The Australian homeowner isn't making any friends in his neighborhood after a complaint was filed for removing trees. He replaced the trees with something else, a giant middle finger. He's accused of headbutting and turning a leaf blower on one neighbor, uh, with another nearby resident calling him a neighbor from hell. And that's the way it is today, Friday, August 5th, 2011. I'm Tom Hartman on the news. listening to the Tom Hartman program and greetings my friends patriots lovers of democracy truth and justice believers in peace freedom and the American way Tom Hartman here with you and it being the first hour on Friday as we've done for for low these many years I believe it's six maybe seven years it'll be our first hour is Senator Sanders brunch with Bernie I like to think of him as America's senator he's the independent from Vermont neither Democrat or Republican and uh, although he caucuses with the Democrats, his website is sanders.senate.gov. He's got a great news site there. He's got a newsletter that you can sign up for, the Bernie Buzz, links to his fake Facebook page and other things. And, uh, and Senator Sanders will be taking your calls after an uh, he and I will have an initial conversation, and then we'll be picking up your calls for the rest of the hour in our national town hall meeting this hour. Your opportunity to speak with not just a United States senator, in my opinion, one of the very best of the United States Senator, Senator Bernie Sanders. Bernie, welcome back. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and thanks for those kind words. I think the issue uh, that is on everybody's mind right now is uh, this deficit reduction plan that was voted on earlier this week. Uh, I voted no on that, uh, and I did for a number of reasons. Um, this plan is grotesquely unfair. Uh, as I think most listeners know, the middle class in this country is doing terribly, terribly badly. Uh, unemployment is, real unemployment is probably over 16 percent, counting people have given up looking for work and people are working part-time. Uh, there was just a piece uh, in the, the paper today 
that uh, recent release data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture shows an all-time high in food stamp recipients, 45.8 million people receiving food stamps. Uh, senior citizens and disabled vets have gone without a cola for the last two years. Uh, older workers, if they're lucky enough to find a job, are often working at new jobs that pay substantially less than uh, their previous oh. job. Uh, you got millions of working class families desperately trying to be able to send their kids to college, uh, not able to do that. Same thing with child care. So we, we are in a real, for working families and low income people, these are terrible, terrible times. And on the other hand, for the wealthiest people in this country, these are great times. Uh, you have a growing gap between the very rich and everybody else. You have the top 400 wealthiest people in this country owning more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans, and that gap is growing wider. Common sense, morality, any sense of decency suggests that if you're going to go forward in deficit reduction, it has to include shared sacrifice. You simply cannot come down hard on the elderly, on the sick, on children, on the lowest income people, the unemployed, and leave millionaires whose effective tax rate now is lower than it's been in decades, leave large multinational corporations who are making billions in profits, and in some cases paying nothing in taxes, leave those guys outside of the equation altogether. They don't have to make one cent pay one cent to a deficit reduction it falls all on the middle class and working families. I think that is a grotesquely immoral. It is it is the Robin Hood proposal in reverse. Uh, we take from the poor and we give to the rich. Second of all, in terms of economics, economic policy, it is a disaster. Conservatively, what we hear from economists is this plan will cost us some 300,000 uh, jobs at a time when we can't afford to lose uh, one job. Now, you know, when I turn on the news, what I constantly hear, and it really does annoy me, is the politics of all this. Like, you know, these, these sometimes these news guys think this is a game. It's the Yankees versus the Red Sox. It is not a game. This decision, this deficit reduction uh, deal, will have a negative, negative impact on tens of millions of Americans. And I want to spell out, if I might, Tom, because I don't think the media has done a very good job on this, just exactly what we're talking about. Now, having said that, the first... The first tranche is $900 billion in cuts in discretionary spending. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, we can't say exactly what programs are going to be cut because that decision will be made in the coming months by the various appropriations committees. No one can say exactly. But let me tell you what I think at least is on the chopping block. If you're a working parent right now and you're getting some federal help for child care or for Head Start, worry. Because I guess my guess is that those programs will be significantly cut. Uh, if your kid is in a public school and it gets Title I education money, worry, because those programs will likely be cut. If you are in a family that wants to send your kids to college but doesn't have the money, then you've got to worry because federal aid for working-class families to go to college will likely be cut. If you know people or yourself are having a hard time getting enough money together in order to eat properly, and we have millions of people who are dealing with hunger issues, kids, senior citizens, worry, because there will clearly be cutbacks in nutrition programs. If you don't have, if you're one of 50 million Americans today who has no health insurance and you utilize a neighborhood community health center, that's something I have fought very, very hard for. We've expanded those clinics worry because it is likely that community health centers will be cut. And if you're living in a city or town which has a budget problem, which almost all do, and you've seen layoffs for uh, police officers or, or, or firemen or librarians, worry because there will be more cuts in federal aid in those programs. If you're a construction worker, you should worry because federal aid for roads and bridges and, and water projects, sewage, public transportation, will likely be cut as well. That's only, Tom, the first $900 billion. You right. with me? Yeah. yeah. Now we go to the next part, which is a super committee made up of six Democrats, six Republicans. The Gang of Twelve. The Gang of Twelve. Now, their mandate is to look at everything, every single thing. Once again, nobody can predict. I don't want to suggest for a moment that I know what this Gang of Twelve will do. But everything is on the table. That's the mandate. That means 
Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. What do we know? We know that our Republican friends for years and increasingly in the, in the last number of months are hell-bent on cutting back on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. That's what we know. We know very, very sadly that the President of the United States has reversed his position from what he campaigned on and is also talking about cutting back on Social Security, perhaps raising the eligibility age for Medicare to 67 from 65, be a total disaster, and also making cuts in Medicaid. All of that, veterans programs, it's on the table. Does that mean to say they will be cut? No, it does not. I do not know what's going to happen. Nobody does. My fear is that the Republicans from day one have been very tough, and they have said, you are not going to raise taxes on the rich. You are not going to do away with the loopholes that enable large corporations like General Electric, ExxonMobil, and other big companies who make billions in profits, in some cases, to pay nothing in federal income tax. You're not going to touch that, because we are here to defend the rich and large corporations. And time after time, we have seen the Democrats retreat. If one Democrat out of the six on the Democratic side goes over to the Republicans, it could be a disaster. Am I saying that's going to happen? No, I'm not. It may well be that it ends in deadlock. 6-6. Six, six. What happens if it ends in deadlock? If it ends in deadlock, then there is about $1.2 trillion over a 10-year period. Everything I'm talking about is a 10-year period in what they call sequestration, which is a fancy word for saying across-the-board cuts. If that happens... What the language reads, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid will be exempt, and veterans programs exempt from those cuts. That's a good thing. But it means that they're going to be – then they'll also have to go after other discretionary programs even more significantly. I mean, things like low-income heating programs, oh, children assistance programs, absolutely. child and care. The other half of it calls for cuts in military spending. So yeah. roughly speaking, $500 billion discretionary 500 billion military it will be a disaster for working families and we've got to focus on that issue senator bernie sanders with us it's our brunch with bernie hour here on the tom hartman program we'll be back with your calls for senator sanders throughout the rest of the hour 15 minutes past the hour here on the tom hartman program this is the Tom Hartman Program. And check out Bernie's website. It's spectacular, sanders.senate.gov. There's an enormous amount of information there. You can feed back directly to the senator. I think it's, it's not a secret uh, to any viewer uh, that Washington is dominated by big money interests uh, and by lobbyists. Uh, the reason that we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs is the Rika, California, watching us on Free Speech TV. Linda, thanks for watching Free Speech TV. What's up? Hi. I, I'm so um, impressed with uh, Senator Sanders. I love you. You are so wonderful. You speak the truth when there's so many lies floating out there. Well, thank you very uh, my much. Question, That's very kind of you. Uh, sir, my question is with those uh, senators, the 12, well, the 12 senators or whatever, there's the gang what are they, uh, aren't they going to um, abridge the 14th Amendment where no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States? Well, I don't... Shall any, any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law? Well, uh, that's not my... Ma <laughs> that's a good question, Linda, but I, I, I think that is not my major... Uh, worry. Uh, and again, the members of that 12-person uh, committee will be appointed uh, by Nancy Pelosi, uh, Democratic leader in the House, John Boehner, Republican leader, the Speaker in the House, uh, Mitch McConnell, Republican leader in the uh, Senate, and Harry Reid, Democratic leader uh, in the Senate. Those will be the 12 people. Uh, my major concern is, and this is how the process will work, the process works is you'll have this 12-person committee. If a majority reaches an agreement, if it's, say, 7-5 or 12 nothing, whatever it is, then it goes to the House and the Senate without any amendments. In the Senate, it will require 51 votes to pass. So my worry is right now that if I think it is more likely, you know, although nobody can predict the future, I think it is more likely that uh, a Democrat might uh, kind of cave in and go with the Republicans 
and then 51 votes can pass something in the Senate, which could be very bad, and it would likely pass in the House. So that is my fear. The Republicans have been very clear. I don't know, Tom, if you've heard what Boehner and, and Mitch McConnell have had to say. Basically, what they're saying is, hey, we're not going to appoint people to this committee who are going to raise taxes. Yeah, no, we've, well. we've played that audio and video on this program. Yeah. They're, they're very explicit about it. Yeah. And, and on the other hand, Nancy Pelosi yesterday said she wasn't drawing any bright lines in the sand, which made me very nervous. Yeah, well, I think it's time for us to draw some lines in the sand and learn that the Republicans have been winning this whole debate. And what amazes me, and here's the irony, every single poll out there shows that the Republican position of no tax breaks on the wealthy, uh, defending uh, high military spending, protecting loopholes, for large corporations. That is a minority, minority position. vast majority of the American people want shared sacrifice. The Republicans don't. And within the Beltway in Washington, they are winning. And that just seems to me to be an outrage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jacob, what's our time right now? Oh, 40 seconds. Bernie, we just have 40 seconds until, the, until we rejoin our commercial stations. Uh, if you, you just want to take that and expand on that point. All right. I, I think the point is very clear. The American people believe in fairness. They understand that working families are struggling. They do not believe that you balance the budget on the backs of people who are sick with cuts in health care, with children who need the best education possible. That's what the American people believe, and we should stand with the American people and not with the big money interests. There you go. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour here now on Free Speech TV as well in homes all across the United States, I believe Canada and Mexico as well, uh, on DirecTV, on Dish TV, and over 200 cable systems around the country on Manhattan neighborhood networks in all five boroughs live right now. Tom Hartman and Bernie Sanders. There's now a free app for the Tom Hartman program at the App Store. You can listen, watch, and read our newsletter, plus the daily stack there. These economic royalists complain that we seek to take away their power. And our allegiance to American institutions requires the overthrow of this kind of power. Welcome back to your media support group for We the People, the Tom Hartman program. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. And John in Dallas, Texas, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. John? No, John. Okay. Bill in Seattle, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. Bill? Yes. Okay, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Senator San Sanders, it's a pleasure speaking to you, sir. I'm a senior citizen, and I'd like to know what movements or group of people I can join to reverse what's going on right now, to stop the Republicans in their tracks and reverse what's going on. Thank you, Bill. Um, well, there are a number of strong senior groups out there, some that come to mind are the National Committee uh, to Preserve um, Social Security and Medicare. Um, the Americans for Retirement uh, Security, I think it's called now. Um, there are a number of, of strong senior groups who are making it very clear, Bill, uh, that Social Security, because it is funded by the payroll tax, has not contributed uh, one nickel toward our deficit, uh, and that it would be absolutely wrong to begin cutting back on uh, Social Security. Um, and that the idea of raising the eligibility age for Medicare, it's incomprehensible. I want people just to think what happens to somebody who does not have a lot of money, and we're seeing more and more Americans who don't have a lot of money. What happens when you get to be 66 and you're dealing with cancer or some other terrible illness and you don't have Medicare? You think you're going to walk into a private insurance company and they're going to give you an affordable health care program? I don't think so. I don't think so. And Medicaid, we got 50 million people who have no health insurance today. Um, we got 45,000 people die because they don't get to a doctor when they should. Cutting Medicaid, throwing children off the health insurance program, working families off, it is just not acceptable. So, Bill, there are some good and strong 
uh, senior groups out there who are prepared to fight. Uh, the National Committee is, is one that I, I have worked with. Nancy, in, in Batesville, Arkansas, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello. Hello, Senator Sanders. I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you. My question is this new committee that they're coming up with, and we have this situation with some members of Congress that signed all these pledges. You know what I'm talking about. I know Why can they not be disqualified for any committee to where they might have to break a pledge? Well, Nancy, that's a great question. Uh, and I think what Nancy is talking about is that many of the Republicans have signed uh, a pledge to Grover Norquist, who is a uh, right-wing fellow who is doing everything that he can to protect the wealthy and the powerful and not ask them to pay anything more in taxes. And what Nancy is asking, if these guys are appointed to the committee, how are they going to do the right thing for America and come up with some uh, deficit reduction program, which is fair? Uh, the answer, Nancy, is I think um, the uh, speaker, the Republican Speaker of the House, uh, John Boehner, and the Republican Minority Leader, uh, Mitch McConnell, have made it very clear that, that that is their belief as well. So anyone who thinks, I know sometimes you're hearing folks out there, well, we think we're going to be able to get some new revenue out of this committee. Maybe. I mean, no one can ever make a prediction. I don't want to speculate. But I think given the fact that the Republicans have said from day one, we're not going to raise taxes on the rich. They have carried that, that mantra through all of the fights, including this deficit reduction bill that was just signed on Tuesday. I have no reason to believe that they will support increased revenue coming from the wealthiest people in this country. So uh, I would say, Nancy, uh, it is very unlikely that you're going to end up with an agreement uh, that is fair given uh, the continued obstinance of the Republicans. Teresa in Asheville, North Carolina. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders and Tom Hartman are fresh air to breathe. Thank you. Listening to all this. Uh, my question is about privatization, and the Congress is, uh, according to the Constitution, is supposed to take care of the business, not sort it out. And where is the facts? Where are the statistics? Where are the government studies that privatization is in any way profitable and economical to the American people that the government represents, that we're, we should pay more for things through privatization than what we get from the government. Where is the studies to say that this is a good idea? Well, that's a very good question, Teresa. Uh, I should tell you that I just last week, uh, Jan Tchaikovsky of Illinois, a member of Congress, and I reintroduced legislation dealing with privatization issues uh, in the military. We're it is particularly offensive uh, because you have private contractors there. The people are working for private contractors who are making substantially more money doing pretty much, in some cases, the same work that members of the United States Armed Forces are doing. And I think we waste a huge amount of money in that. I think, Tom, I don't know if you have discussed on your show some a study done in New York City where I guess New York City uh, hired some firm to, to try to be cost-effective, and it turned out that the private firm... Uh, was ripping off oh, yeah. the city there to the tune of tens and tens of millions of dollars. So bottom line is, you know, I, I was a mayor, uh, and we looked at this whole issue of privatization. And, and I think that in the vast majority of the cases, if you have good management, and you don't always do, and you have motivated public employees doing what they're supposed to be doing, uh, your turnover will be less. People will see this, their jobs with as careers, take responsibility uh, rather than uh, privatization. So uh, I'm not a great fan of privatization, I should tell you the reason. Yeah, and, and this is why it's a good thing to have civil servants have pensions and a decent salary so that exactly. they'll, they'll stay and, in place. And that's another issue, by the way, that I worry about a whole lot uh, with these cutbacks on, on benefits and, and wages for public employees. Yeah, very well said. Senator Bernie Sanders is with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour here on the Tom Hartman program. Check out his website, Sanders.Senate. Gov. We'll be back with more of your calls for Bernie. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. It's our national town hall meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders. Brunch with Bernie on the Tom Hartman Program. Sanders.Senate.gov. Check it out. Tom Hartman here on the news. 
you need to know this. Welcome to the chaotic American economy. One day after the Dow Jones suffered its worst single-day decline since the height of the Bush financial crisis in 2008, plummeting 512 points yesterday, new job numbers were released showing better-than-expected job growth. The economy added 117,000 jobs last month, lowering the unemployment rate from 9.2 to 9.1 percent, even though layoffs surged in July and new GDP numbers showed the economic recovery is stalling out. The new jobs are just barely enough to keep up with population growth, and economists still fear a double-dip recession is right around the corner. After all, the most recent debt limit deal that Speaker John Boehner is boasting he got 98 percent of what he wanted in is expected to cost the economy 1.8 million jobs by next year and suck over $200 billion from the economy just in time for the 2012 election. And Republicans are planning three more hostage takings, at least economy-killing actions just this year. Looks like Republicans will get exactly what they want, a crashed economy to hang around the neck of President Obama before next year's elections. The Republican hostage takers get what they want again. Yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid announced the Senate will pass the House Republicans' version of the FAA funding bill that strips subsidies to rural airports, mostly in Democratic districts, and makes it much more difficult for federal air and rail workers to unionize. The bill is expected to pass the Senate today, putting the 74,000 FAA and construction workers who were the victims of the last Republican hostage scenario back to work. Senate leadership said nothing about the anti-union provisions in the funding bill that will only keep the FAA up and running until mid-September when lawmakers return from their vacation. So expect this break in the FAA hostage crisis to be only temporary. In the best of the rest of the news, it's good to be an American, a millionaire in America. A new report from the Center for American Progress showed that millionaires are paying, as a share of their income, 25% less in taxes than they were during the Clinton years in the mid-90s, 25% less. That's not all. According to data from the IRS in 2009, 1,400 millionaires paid absolutely no taxes at all. So just like some of the biggest transnational corporations in the world, like GE and ExxonMobil, 1,400 millionaires were off the hook and didn't have to pitch in one penny to Uncle Sam. In fact, the average federal income tax rate for millionaires in America is around 22%, far less than your typical school teacher in Wisconsin is paying. And despite the fact that a majority of Americans support tax hikes on millionaires, our millionaires, as well as billionaires and transnational corporations, once again escaped without having to make one sacrifice in the name of deficit reduction like the rest of us. Last time I checked, the Constitution doesn't say we the millionaires. Thank you, Citizens United. Sarcastically, of course, Mitt Romney's presidential campaign war chest just got a million dollars heavier, and no one knows who's responsible. In one of the biggest contributions yet of this political season, the company W Span LLC cut a check to Mitt Romney for $1 million and then disappeared. The corporation was created in March, made the contribution in April, and then dissolved in July. No one really knows who was running the company during that time, and the owner of the Manhattan address that was listed for the company claims he has no records of the company ever setting up shop there. So essentially, Mitt Romney just got a million bucks out of thin air. That could have come from some billionaire hedge fund manager, some Chinese business tycoon, some Saudi prince. Who knows? Justice Department says they're looking into the matter, but either way, thanks to our Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, the American people no longer have the right to know where their political candidates are getting their money. Expect this mysterious and sinister million-dollar contribution to be the first of many heading into next year's first presidential election after the unelected justices Roberts, Thomas, Scalia, Alito, and Kennedy rewrote our election laws. Surprise! After the dysfunction of Congress was put on full display in the debt limit debate, or a debacle, if you prefer. New numbers show Congress's disapproval rating is at an all-time high of 82%. That's the worst rating for Congress since the New York Times started keeping track back in 1997. But looking closer at the numbers, it's clear one party is more to blame than the other. Speaker of the House John Boehner's disapproval rating is up 16 points since July to 57%, 10 points higher than President Obama. And also, Republican disapproval ratings in Congress is at 72%, Democrats just 66 percent. This fits perfectly into the anti-American Republican political strategy, run on a platform of no government, get elected and run government into the ground, then run for a re-election on a platform of no government. Thirsty? Go to Mars. NASA reported a huge discovery on the red planet yesterday, flowing water. New pictures show what looked to be dark streams on the Martian surface 
that appear to change seasonally, indicating that salt water may be present on our nearest planetary neighbor. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden said that the discovery about the discovery of NASA's Mars Exploration Program brings us closer to determining, determining whether the red planet could harbor life in some form. Well, as soon as we find out, can we send the Ron Paul and Ayn Rand libertarians up there so they can start their free market commune? It's never worked anywhere it's been tried on Earth. Maybe the lower gravity on Mars will change the laws of economics. And crazy alert, we meet the world's worst neighbor, David Muscat. The Australian homeowner isn't making any friends in his neighborhood after a complaint was filed for removing trees. He replaced the trees with something else, a giant middle finger. He's accused of headbutting and turning a leaf blower on one neighbor. Uh, with another nearby resident calling him a neighbor from hell. And that's the way it is today, Friday, August 5th, 2011. I'm Tom Hartman on the news. One candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. He's everything you want. He's everything you need. Welcome back to here with you. It's our brunch with Bernie, our Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. Bernie, you're still here? I do. Oh. Tom and I, I yes, sir. I think it's important that everybody understand the clip that you just played. Uh, that was FDR. Yes. Uh, that was, what, 1936? Yes, July 36. Okay. And what that was about is this was the beginning of his campaign for a second term in which he won with a huge landslide. And in the middle of the Depression, he made it very clear which side he was on, that he was going to be on the side of the unemployed, uh, the side of the people who were really hurting, and he was prepared to take on the big money interest that had driven the country into the ground. He made it very clear. And I think one of the problems that we're having today is that the American people are angry, they're frustrated, they're confused, uh, they are angry at Congress, uh, angry at the president, angry at Wall Street, angry at the media. There is no clarity out there as to what is going on. And we need leadership. We need the president to make it very clear that when you have a handful of multinational corporations, a big money interest in Wall Street, a wrecking havoc on our economy. They have got to be taken on, and we're just not seeing that clarity right now. Castle, watching us in, on Free Speech TV in Waterbury, Vermont. You're on the air with, with your senator, Senator Sanders. Outstanding. Good afternoon, Senator Sanders. Hi, Tom. Um, I'd like to ask you about the FEMA bailouts here in Vermont, calling from Waterbury, Vermont State Hospital. Um, my understanding is that yesterday was the lowest point in the stock market since September 1st, 2008. So wondering if with the FEMA money, will there be growth here in Vermont? Well, Castle, that's a very good good question. I, I think, um, you know, we had some serious flooding uh, in the state of Vermont. Uh, I think the FEMA people did a good job working with the governor. I know the delegation did our best to make sure that Vermont got its fair share. But among all of the other programs that are out there that could be cut in the future, Absolutely, uh, FEMA is one of them. So we are trying to do our best to make sure that Vermont gets its fair share, its fair share to help uh, the homes, the businesses, and the towns that were hit by our flooding. Uh, but I worry about FEMA in the future. Andy, Andy, yes, in Redwood City, Cal California. Andy, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders. Hi. Hey, thank, thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you're, you. You're one of the only people working that actually represents working people. I want to talk about a uh, article that came out in the Financial Times July 13th about free trade deals, and it talks about South Korea, Panama, and Colombia. And the Chamber of Commerce is saying that the deal with South Korea is going to create like 280,000 jobs. The White House says it's going to create 70,000 jobs to do the deal, and a uh, think tank Economic Policy Institute says we will lose 159,000 jobs if we do the deal with South Korea. Now, in this same article, it indicates 55% of Americans from a Pew survey 
believe that free trade deals cost Americans jobs, and only 35% in the survey actually support free trade deals. When is Washington going to get it that these free trade deals are killing us, Bernie? They're killing our employment system. GATT, WTO, NAFTA, they're all killing us, and the Obama administration does not get it. They still think it's going to create jobs. And he's going to use that as a job creation program. This is insanity. Andy, let me uh, respond in, in this way. I agree with you, period. Um, I've been through this. I used to be in the House, and I remember all of the large corporations in the Chamber of Commerce telling us how great NAFTA would be. And then they told us how great permanent normal trade relations with China would be and how great CAFTA would be and now how great these trade agreements would be. Look. It is harder and harder to buy products manufactured in the United States of America. And I've been working with the Smithsonian. I'm working with other government agencies to do their best. We're having some success to stop buying American products. But here is the fact. I agree with Andy. Uh, we have year after year been running up huge trade deficits, especially with China. And this, Tom and Andy, is not just um, uh, low-tech stuff. You know, we're not talking about sneakers and, and pants and shirts. We're increasingly talking about high-tech uh, products. Uh, we are talking about also information uh, technology, white-collar jobs, in addition to blue-collar jobs. But I believe Andy is right. Uh, the facts are that in the last 10 years, we've lost about 50,000 factories in the United States of America. Uh, not all of them were connected to trade, but many of them were. And the reality is, is that if you're paying people pennies an hour in another country, it makes absolute sense for a company to shut down in America, pay pennies an hour, and then bring that product back into the United States of America. And you've seen that in virtually every single industry. We have a, a granite industry here in the state of Vermont. Granite is pretty heavy stuff. And yet China is bringing granite into this country because it is cheaper to transport the granite to make your, your, your monuments and so forth over there than it is to pay American workers a decent wage in this country. So I think uh, if you look at major corporation after major corporation, they have downsized in the United States. Their job growth is in China and other developing countries. If the economy of this country is going to be is going to, if our middle class is going to be saved, then we're going to see economic growth. I think we have to reverse uh, that entire mentality about unfettered free trade. David, in uh, agreed. David in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Sanders. Uh, I saw a very interesting uh, blog post by a guy named uh, Blog Seska who uh, is saying that he's done some analysis of the debt deal uh, bill and finds that because the everything that this super congress is going to do is based is rooted in the uh, uh, government accounting office figures that it assumes the expiration of the bush tax cuts at the end of next year uh, i was wondering what your take on this was is, is that uh, a fact as far as you know or have you heard anything and what are the what implications are there with that? It may be a, 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 a silver lining. Well, David, here is uh, when you deal with huge sums of money. Uh, you know, this uh, debt re deficit reduction uh, deal is could be two and a half trillion over a ten year period. Other programs out there, Bull Simpson, were over four trillion, and so forth. Uh, everything has to do with what is called the baseline, where you start from. And then it gets very, very tricky because you can have very uh, honest differences as to what your baseline would be. Uh, one of the things that the CBO, probably more likely than the GAO, would estimate is that everything being equal uh, in uh, another year, the Bush tax breaks for everybody, that's the wealthy and everybody and the middle class, would expire. Uh, and that would mean... Uh, that uh, four billion dollars, four trillion dollars. No, let me get. Yeah, four trillion dollars over a ten-year period would be coming in to the government. So that really uh, stilts uh, your analysis because very few people believe 
that certainly for the middle class, which is over three trillion of that four trillion, very few people believe that politically those would disappear. So under the CBO calculations is uh, the government will be getting over a 10 year period four trillion more because all of the tax breaks would expire. Politically, nobody thinks, or very few people think, that the middle class tax breaks will be allowed to expire. Some of us, in fact, do want tax breaks for the upper income people to expire, which would be about $700 billion. So depending on how you calculate that, it makes a heck of a lot of difference. Jim in Somerdale, Ohio. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, good afternoon, Senator. Hi, Jim. Uh, isn't it like your position or one of your jobs as a senator to make amendments to the Constitution. I don't know if that's right or not, but it seems to me that we need some amendments to the Constitution. One, to limit the Supreme Court judges' terms and how they are elected instead of appointed by the big business. And then two, also limit the terms of our, you know, that would take the money out of the politics, wouldn't it? The big business would get out of it. And then limit the terms of the senators and congressmen so that the people do put them in and are elected to give us a fair chance. We, we have to do something. We're being sold out, and it's just the ruination. We got it. We just, just a minute to the break here, Jim. Let's okay. let Bernie answer. Uh, Jim, we are being sold out in many respects, and you're absolutely right saying that money – uh, and, and, and the big money campaign contributions are, are probably at the root of most of the problems that we face. I'm not a great fan of term limits. People may say, well, that's self-serving. You're an elected official. Uh, I think if you have term limits and everybody goes, uh, it is not going to guarantee uh, a stronger or more progressive Congress. I think, Jim, the real solution is real, real campaign finance reform, and that means public funding of elections so that everybody has a fair shot at getting elected rather than being dependent upon uh, big money. Well said. And and also, with term limits, the only institutional memory that's left are the lobbyists, because they're there from term to term. They have an increased degree of power. Yeah, it increases their power. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. His website, sanders.senate.gov. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour here on the Tom Hartman program. We'll be back with more of your calls and your questions for the senator right after this. Stick around. 45 minutes after the hour. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. By the way, Bernie has a great free newsletter that's available to any, regardless of where you live, available over at his website at Sanders.Senate.gov. And welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. Jane in Limerick, Maine, watching on Free Speech TV. Jane, thanks for watching Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Senator Sanders. Thank you, Jane. And, and um, I don't, it's too bad you're the only one in the whole body of Congress who speaks our language. But I want to know if peak oil has anything to do with the current global economic crisis. Because we've reached peak oil, it costs more to get it out of the ground than it used to, Mm -hmm. and it's a great big um, subject, and no political person ever, ever speaks about it. But I go to meetings every week in the town hall of Limerick, Maine, and I hear about it every week. And that's the source of the giant problems going on today. Well, Jane, let me tell you that, yes, I, I think uh, the point you're making is right, that as oil becomes scarcer and harder to obtain, uh, it becomes uh, not only oil but gas as well. Uh, from an environmental perspective, it is it gets worse and worse to exploit the oil, to dig for the oil. Uh, and furthermore, it becomes more expensive. Um, so I think there is no question to my mind uh, that we have to transform our energy system away from uh, fossil fuel and oil in particular uh, to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Um, and I want to give you some some good news, Jane, uh, and listeners out there. I know there's not a lot of good news, but I was just on the phone uh, yes, uh, day before yesterday with a bunch of people who are active in, in, in the solar uh, thermal area, concentrated solar energy. Many people are not aware that right now, 
there are many, many plants that are being developed based on solar energy, which are utility scale, that will be located in the southwest of this country, California, Nevada, Arizona, uh, which have the capability, and we're going to see one that's already begun construction, which can produce electricity for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of homes. One plant using the sun as its source of energy. I think if we invest in that technology, if we move toward energy efficiency, if we take advantage of geothermal, of wind, uh, of biomass, we can break our dependence on Mideast oil, and that's terribly important from a geopolitical point of view. Uh, in the long run, with new technology, I think we can substantially lower the cost of these new technologies uh, and, and obviously uh, cut back substantially on greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, Jane, I think that peak oil gives us the impetus to be more aggressive uh, in terms of sustainable energy. And I'm happy to say, you know, I've been critical of the Obama administration in a number of areas, but we are beginning in this area to make some progress. And I think the potential there is huge. And it's not just the Southwest. Our mutual friend Hal Cohen lives in a house in Vermont that's completely off the grid. No, absolutely. You can do solar uh, anywhere in America. And in Vermont, where you know, where I help bring in some money in Vermont, we're doing solar here. We're doing it all over America. But in the Southwest, you have really optimal uh, solar exposure. Uh, and we can make some real progress there as well. Yeah, it's, it's crazy not to be using that. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour here on the Tom Hartman program and now also live on Free Speech TV. We will be back with more of your calls right after this. It's 49 minutes past the hour. Be sure to check out Bernie's website, sanders.senate.gov. His newsletter, The Bernie Buzz. There's links to his Facebook page. Lots of cool stuff there. It's actually a good news resource. to have it said of my second administration that in it these forces met their master. Helping you win the water cooler wars. Tom Hartman here with you. Welcome back. It's our brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls and Robert in Fort Bragg, California, listening on KNYO. Robert, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, hi, Tom and Bernie. Thanks, you guys, for all the work you do, and thanks, Senator Sanders, for voting against that debt ceiling thing. You guys rock. Anyway, uh, I'm a postal retiree, and I'd like to know how this new poison pill we're getting is going to affect the old CSRS retirement system. Good question. Any ideas on that one? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have all of the information in front of me. The issue here is to what degree it will impact, if at all, those who are already retired. Probably the, the more pertinent question is, what does it do for people who have been working for the federal government for 20, 25 years of what happens to their retirement benefits? There is a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion about not only the existing freeze that we'll have for a couple of years on the wages of federal employees, but also asking them, current employees, to pay more for their retirement. And what upsets me about all of that is this is part of the Republican effort to uh, go after public employees uh, to say, uh, and, 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 and doing that, it is going to discourage, I think, good people from wanting to get into public employment. God knows we need the best and the brightest to be working in all areas of government. And second of all, it plays off private. It, it, it leads us to the race to the bottom. And, and, and what the line is, gee, these public employees have all of these benefits and you don't have it in the private sector. The answer is to make sure that our private sector employees have decent benefit programs, which, by the way, have been cut drastically in recent years. So rather than proceed to a race to the bottom, we want to protect what the public employees have, which are in some cases decent middle class benefits and make sure that the private sector gets it rather than take away what the public sector workers have. Charles in Portland, Oregon. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. 
Uh, good morning, Tom. Good morning, Senator Sanders. Uh, pleasure to speak with both of you. And uh, a definite shout-out from Tom Dwyer Automotive in Portland. you got a lot of fans here for both of you. Oh, good on Tom Dwyer, a regular advertiser in KPOJ. What's up, Charles? Um, I was curious, you know, with the Super Congress coming up here and everything, um, what are the chances of getting uh, Senator Sanders on the team for that? I mean, has it already been picked or all, you know, it's been picked and not announced? Or can, can we get Senator Sanders, somebody in our corner out there, on, on that budget team? Well, Charles, thank you very much. And I, I understand, I read somewhere there's a petition going around which would ask that some of the more progressive members of the House and the Senate be, be put on that committee, including myself, Raul Grijalver, and, and some others. And I think that would be great. I, I would love to be on that committee. Uh, whether it will happen or not, you know, I, I'm not quite so sure. Uh, but certainly, thank you for asking. I would love to be on that committee. Bernice in Santa Fe, New Mexico, listening on AM 1260. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders. Well, that's part of what I wanted to do, of course. I want to uh, nominate you to be on the uh, Super Congress Committee. Um, but I also have some um, recommendations. I think that, you know, we're, we're not very good, we Democrats um, or independents, about messaging, and Tom's a big, you know, big advocate for this, but we need a great PR campaign to advertise uh, that we're going to do uh, – Real, a lot of tax cuts and tax breaks for American companies. We're going to cut taxes for all Americans that earn under $250,000. And, of course, we're not going to do anything about the expiring Bush cuts, uh, you know, in January for above that. Uh, we can have a tax amnesty for one year for American companies to return from overseas. And after the first year, they're taxed uh, as under Clinton or Reagan, except that uh, there'll be a new law where they'll get a, a slight tax break only for employees who are employed within the U.S. borders. Uh, and then we can finally um, relieve a big burden by providing health care. Uh, they, we can relieve them of that burden by providing Medicare for all. And, you know, I think we just need to advertise this. Well, I agree with you, Bernice, that we need – what you're really talking about is you need a progressive agenda, which is simple, which is straightforward – which will have a real impact on the lives of ordinary Americans and an agenda that people can understand. Uh, and I agree. Uh, the difficulty, to be frank with you, is that not everybody in the Democratic caucus will agree with what you say. I believe in a Medicare for All uh, program that's called the Single Payer Program. I hope the state of Vermont will lead the nation in that direction. But I will tell you that in the United States Senate, there are probably not more than five, ten max. Uh, senators who would agree with that. Uh, I agree uh, very strongly in terms of figuring out a way, whatever that way may be, to demand that corporations in this country who have been laying off millions of American workers start reinvesting in America rather than in China. And there are all ways to do that. The American people want that to happen. Right now, insanely, you have tax policies which virtually encourage companies to shut down in America and go abroad. That is absolutely insane. Uh, and that gets back to the trade policies that a previous caller uh, talked about. So uh, Bernice's point that we need to be simple, straightforward, progressive, have ideas that make sense to ordinary people and carry them forward. I, I agree with that assertion. Bernie, wasn't there, we just have about 50 seconds left here, not enough time to bring in another caller, but wasn't there legislation that was passed out of the House by Nancy Pelosi in the last legislative session that essentially did that trade, not not changed our trade laws, but that gave, that ended the tax break for companies that, that shut down factories here and gave them a tax benefit if they brought factories back? And it I, got filibustered by the Republicans in the Senate? Can't swear to you. It, it, that sounds right. I, I, I won't swear to you because I don't I, I'm quite sure there was. I, yeah. I, I would be willing to swear to that. So. Right. But this is an issue. This whole issue about globalization and the point that I think it was Andy earlier in the show made, the American people understand that our current policy of unfettered free trade hasn't worked. But read the editorials out of every major paper in America. Hear from the Chamber of Commerce. And for all the corporate leaders, they will tell you how great unfettered free trade is. While it may be good for the big money and trust, it is not good for working people. Absolutely. Senator Bernie Sanders. Bernie, thanks so much for being with us today. Good to be with As you. As always. Uh, and check out Bernie's website, sanders.senate.gov. There is a whole raft of great information over there and a lot of good resources.
We will be back with a report from Alec Watch. What's going on in New Orleans as our as our laws are being bought? You're listening to Tom Hartman. Tom Hartman here. Thanks so much for watching our program. Our program is underwritten in part by SolarWorld. For more information, visit SolarWorld.com. SolarWorld has a 35-year history in the manufacturing of solar in America. EdisonFactor.com. Edison Factor is a supplement for the brain. Angie'sList.com. Detailed reviews on roofers, plumbers, house cleaners, dentists, and more. Carbonite.com automatic online backup and file recovery, stamps.com, postage online from your computer, and our website, tomhartman.com. And thanks so much for watching our program here on Free Speech TV again. And check out freespeech.org for our program and other great programming right here on Free Speech TV. Tom Hartman here on the news. You need to know this. Welcome to the chaotic American economy. One day after the Dow Jones suffered its worst single-day decline since the height of the Bush financial crisis in 2008, plummeting 512 points yesterday, new job numbers were released showing better-than-expected job growth. The economy added 117,000 jobs last month, lowering the unemployment rate from 9.2 to 9.1%. Even though layoffs surged in July, a new GDP number showed the economic recovery is stalling out. The new jobs are just barely enough to keep up with population growth, and economists still fear a double-dip recession is right around the corner. After all, the most recent debt limit deal that Speaker John Boehner is boasting he got 98% of what he wanted in is expected to cost the economy 1.8 million jobs by next year and suck over $200 billion from the economy just in time for the 2012 election. And Republicans are planning three more hostage takings, at least economy killing actions just this year. Looks like Republicans will get exactly what they want, a crashed economy to hang around the neck of President Obama before next year's elections. The Republican hostage takers get what they want again. Yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid announced the Senate will pass the House Republicans version of the FAA funding bill that strips subsidies to rural airports, mostly in Democratic districts, it makes it much more difficult for federal air and rail workers to unionize. The bill is expected to pass the Senate today, putting the 74,000 FAA and construction workers who were the victims of the last Republican hostage scenario back to work. Senate leadership said nothing about the anti-union provisions in the funding bill that will only keep the FAA up and running until mid-September when lawmakers return from their vacation. So expect this break in the FAA hostage crisis to be only temporary. In the best of the rest of the news, it's good to be an American, a millionaire in America. A new report from the Center for American Progress showed that millionaires are paying, as a share of their income, 25% less in taxes than they were during the Clinton years in the mid-90s, 25% less. That's not all. According to data from the IRS, in 2009, 1,400 millionaires paid absolutely no taxes at all. So just like some of the biggest transnational corporations in the world, like GE and ExxonMobil, 1,400 millionaires 